Hello, all you Ethicuties and the 40% of you who have not joined the Ethics Verse yet. Welcome to the coolest place to be every Thursday at noon Eastern if you are all about improving your workplace, your workplace culture, and so forth. We got a phenomenal one for you today. I'm so excited. Uh, we have the one and only Mary Shirley and Lisa Estrada. We're going to be talking about hacking ethical innovation. A couple of quick announcements. As I'm going through these announcements, of course, Drop in your LinkedIn URL. Your network is your net worth. Neither are big enough, so you need to connect with at least one person today. And you know what? Start bringing some friends to the Ethics Verse. We're trying to get up to a, an average of a thousand uh, ethics and compliance and employee relations professionals every single week. So invite your friends, or I guess don't if you want to keep these uh, these nuggets and these uh, this little secret to yourself. Hit our link tree. Oh yeah, also drop in where you're coming from. Today, we are trying to break our emoji record, okay? So you're gonna be hearing a lot of cool ideas, a lot of cool hacks, you get it? Get it, We're, we got a little hacker theme going today. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of cool hacks and a lot of great ideas from two of the smartest people I've ever met. So keep those emojis coming, I love it, okay? I haven't had lunch yet, but I'm feeding off of your energy. Uh, hit our link tree, you should see a link tree in the console. This will let you get connected with Ethico uh, everywhere that we are. So check out our YouTube channel for re, uh, replays of the ethics experts, for replays of the ethics verse. Uh, hit us with a demo if you wanna see our new tool. Um, you know, follow me on LinkedIn if you dare, but hit that link tree and you can see us everywhere. Uh, we are giving away, round of applause, we're giving away even more of my new favorite book, Level Up, 65 Hacks and Cheat Codes to Level Up Your Ethics and Compliance Program by Mary Shirley. This book is ripping off the shelves. Amazon can't even get these orders fulfilled fast enough. So uh, we got a couple on deck here that we're, we're going to be sending out to the people that have the best innovations in the chat, that ask the best questions in the chat, and that send the, most, the, the best emojis, okay? A couple of other things, like I said, we're giving away five of those. As always, world famous Ethico Ethics Verse book giveaway. Compliance Week is right around the corner. So if you don't have that dialed in, you got to do something this year. Compliance Week is a great opportunity for you to raise awareness in your organization. Our job is to crowdsource risk intelligence at scale, which we obviously can't do unless the human sensors in our organization are activated. And it's so and so it's on you to influence those folks, uh, get a little bit of participation, raise some awareness around your ethics and compliance program, and really start supercharging the risk intelligence that you're able to gather. If you haven't done anything yet, not to worry. Uh, can we drop into the chat, gang? Uh, we're going to drop into the chat the link to our uh, highly. I think it's I think it's award winning. Uh, my brother gave me an award for it, uh, and then I passed it on to our marketing team. Uh, Award-winning uh, Compliance Week Toolkit. It's got everything there for you to plug and play and just launch that forward. We stole some ideas. Don't tell Mary. Uh, Mary, plug your ears, please. We stole some ideas from Mary. Put those into Compliance Week so you can plug and play and just get something going. We did a Compliance Week roundtable a couple of weeks back, and someone was talking about how their first Compliance Week was really just a half-day thing. And over time, three or four years later, now it's a full week, and they have speakers and all this kind of stuff. So do something to get going. Remember that you're on a compliance journey. This is not a destination. We also have a misconduct mystery game. So if nothing else, you can do this, film this, uh, send this around to folks, and it's a great way to raise awareness. We showed the video a couple of times. People loved it. Uh, so check that misconduct mystery game out. There's a great explainer video there. If you are interested in this, which I can't imagine why you wouldn't be, we have uh, two cool things to offer you. So one is a custom benchmark report. Go ahead and drop a one in the chat. We've done dozens and dozens of these. Uh, we take some of your data, we drop them into a nice uh, PDF report charted against the benchmarks for your industry if you're in healthcare or the general uh, population if you're not in healthcare, and uh, along with the, stat the status quo data and a bunch of data points and a bunch of uh, hacks to improve your metrics. It's really hard for us to show our value if we can't point to metrics on how we are improving. And this is a great way to get going with that. So drop a one in the chat for that custom benchmark report. And if you're interested in one of these ROI coaching sessions that I've become famous for, uh, drop a two in the chat and someone on our team will reach out to you. And these have never, you know, we did an ROI session last week that people seem to love. Uh, there is so much value in what we do. It's I've never done uh, one of these ROI coaching sessions in I, where I haven't been able to find a ton of value to help bolster a persuasion path to get the tools, the headcount increase or whatever folks need. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and drop that two in the chat. Uh, the ecosystem is getting bigger and bigger, okay? 
Uh, you're not going to believe this one, but one of our, uh, we did a demo last week and this person lives uh, right outside of Hollywood, California, and they gave us a call back afterwards and they're trying to get the ecosystem on the Hollywood Walk of Fame right next to Marilyn Monroe. So very bizarre, very embarrassing. Hopefully that uh, goes through. But yeah, if you're interested in the ecosystem, hit the demo button on the link tree or drop a three in the chat and someone will reach out to you. I uh, want to talk about a couple of other books that are um, really getting popular in our uh, community. One is Speak Up is Awesome by Tom Fox. Hit that QR code if you haven't picked that up. You definitely got to get this book. It's a couple of bucks. It's one of Tom Fox's bestsellers ever. It's a great way to teach your children what you do and also uh, teach them to speak up. You want to teach your kids to speak up early and often. Ethics and Compliance for hum for Humans, this is an important work, okay? Uh, this is by Adam Balfour. We gave out a bunch of these at SCCE last week. Uh, if you haven't picked this up, I encourage you to do so as well. Hit that QR code. And finally, The Champions Network by Matt Silverman. We had a phenomenal party. This was like the biggest party in all of Chicago, not just at SCCE. A big, big, a big book launch party for Mary's book, which we're giving away, and Matt Silverman's book, The Champion Network. So this is about how, how to build a blueprint to expand your influence uh, and spread big ideas in any kind of an organization. So go ahead and hit that QR code if you haven't picked that up. I just kind of lined up all your reading for the next month at least, okay? So go ahead and grab those. Let me tell you what's coming up next week. Next week, we have Erica Salmon Byrne from uh, Ethisphere coming on, and we're going to be talking about literally the biggest hack uh in addition to what you're learning today, of course, the biggest hack for you to get more uh, reports and more risk intelligence together into one spot, and that's activating your middle manager. So we're going to be talking about proxy reporting. We're going to be talking about a bunch of these um, these reports that have come out of Ethisphere and ECI and talk about ways that you, you know, and we'll probably have a little toolkit for you because we love you uh, on how to really activate those folks and get, you know, get all these reports that are going on in your organization into one spot so you can get a clearer picture of the risk pro profile of your organization. You don't want to miss that one. And then after that, we have uh, the following week, we have permission to pause, mindfulness tips uh, for ENC and HR pros. Uh, a lot of us are so overloaded with our jobs, it's hard for us to uh, ever pause. And so we have Nadine Cherry, she's a mindfulness expert uh, who does, who really coaches organizations, Fortune 500 companies. She's coming in uh, and she's going to give us some great tips to uh to pause and you know reset a little bit okay all of that to say round of applause let's drop some big we are off to a good start with this emoji record you guys this is phenomenal okay first and foremost we have head of compliance mary shirley of massimo so she is a uh new zealand uh lawyer with 18 years of ethics and compliance experience one of my closest friends in the game author of several books um really world famous sort of thought leader at this point so mary welcome Glad, glad that you're here. Thanks, Nick. And good job living up to your uh, avatar, Mary. You're, uh, <laughs> you're doing great. Uh, and we also have Lisa Estrada. Lisa and Mary used to work together in a previous life. Uh, Lisa is the Chief Administrative Officer and General Counsel at, at Scion Health. She became Scion Health's top legal counsel upon uh, the company's launch in December of 2021. And now she oversees several functions, including legal, governance, risk, uh, compliance, human resources, and diversity, inclusion, and, and equity. So uh, Lisa is a walking hat rack. Uh, she does it all. And you guys are going to hear some of that today. And you, of course, know me, Nick Gallo, chief servant of Ethico. My avatar today, it's a little rainy here in Charlotte. So I'm kind of a little bit of a sad boy today. I'm going to be a little emo today, but I think I've earned it with this. Okay. With that, let's dive right into our content today. Thank you guys all for listening through that. So why don't we just dive right in? Mary, when we talk about innovation, what does that mean for the average uh, compliance officer? Yeah. You know, I used to be concerned about not being a very creative individual. And um, innovation is something where I think you feel like you have to be always coming up with new ideas, doing things differently and advancing in some way. And I read a quote a few years ago, which was something along the lines of, um, in order to be innovative, you do not necessarily have to be the one that's doing the innovating. You just have to be good at recognizing innovative ideas. So um, you need not be the one who's ideating always yourself, um, but being able to spot things that others are working on or take inspiration from works that others have started and that you can refine and polish to suit your circumstances. Uh, so for me, innovating is about 
um, understanding that we can't be complacent in our roles. The field of ethics and compliance is always evolving. And in fact, it's in the name itself. We didn't used to be ethics and compliance. It just used to be compliance or regulatory compliance. And that was the rules-based um, field. And then as time has moved on, we've gone yeah. more into principles-based um, practice. So um, thinking about innovation to me is about thinking about what the status quo um how that currently stands and how we can build upon it and keep moving, not only in, in line with what regulators and authorities are suggesting that we do, but also in terms of uh, thinking about the values of our organization, the culture of integrity we have in our organization and that unique circumstance and making it fit for purpose for the stakeholders that we serve, our internal customers. And why do you think we struggle so much with this innovation? Why is the status quo so cozy? Yeah, I think a, a, one of the easiest um, pitfalls for people to become complacent is when you've just done something, for example, won an award for your compliance program, you've just finished a corporate integrity agreement or a monitorship. And so based on that, you feel pretty safe and comfortable about, hey, I've got a quality compliance program. However, if you've come out of a corporate integrity agreement in 2010, and it's now 2023 and you're like sweet i've got a really good compliance program and you're doing the exact same thing you were doing during the duration of that corporate integrity agreement or that fcpa monitorship um there's a good chance that you you don't um you, it's ju not just that you have a you don't have a best practice compliance program but you've probably fallen behind because compliance is a space in which the goalposts are always moving and i know i'm not telling you listening anything new i know you're all keeping up to date on this especially if you're attending your ethics verse webinars regularly um, but I just want to make the point that it can be super easy for us to feel a false sense of security in our space because of one thing that we did in the past and not realizing that the times are changing and we've got to keep moving in line with that pace. Yeah, that's a great point. I think if we, it's easy to not, it's easy to, to, I guess you have to make an intentional decision to fall into a continuous improvement mode. And if you're not, then you're mm -hmm. just going to sort of stick to that status quo and you're going to, you know, uh, you're not going to be kind of moving it forward. Lisa, what would mm -hmm. you add to uh, what Mary said? And, you know, maybe talk to us a little bit about why it's so critical uh, to keep that innovation muscle, you know, toned. Yeah, um, and and I'm going to hit some of the same notes as Mary did. Not surprisingly, we agree on a lot here. But what I'll say is just as boldly as I can, innovation is not optional. It's not optional in any industry, in any business, in any segment or function within a business. Um, the, the world is moving forward. If you are content um, doing the same thing today that you did yesterday, last month, last year, the year before, you are falling behind. Um, and, and ultimately, you're not, you're not just keeping up with the industry, with the expectations, you're not keeping up with your own company, because the rest of your company, if it's going to survive in the world, is waking up every day thinking about innovation. Now, that doesn't mean, I agree with Mary, that you wake up every day trying to come up with a breakthrough technology. You do, everybody doesn't need to be Elon Musk and shooting for the moon, right? Um, there are many different kinds of innovation. There's that breakthrough innovation. Um, but two that I think are particularly relevant in compliance and ethical compliance are um, incremental innovation, that continuous improvement that you, you mentioned, Nick, um, making small iterative improvements to existing processes. But the one I find mo most interesting um, is recombinant in innovation, which is Comp, you know, re, having in that term, recombining, taking different ideas from different spheres, putting them together in different ways, maybe putting them together multiple times till you get it right. Um, but that kind of innovation is the feels like breakthrough innovation, um, but without all of the decades and years of, of research trying to come up with that like lightning strike. So. Um, you know, it, it doesn't require those those lightning strikes of brilliance to be able to be an innovator. It requires, it's more about creating processes um, that bring in different ideas, opening yourself up to 
the idea that you may learn something on a webinar about IP that may be something that will trigger that thing in your mind that will really make you think differently about compliance. So it's about the processes that you create for ideation, for problem solving, and it's about for leaders within an organization, the environment you create to encourage people to, to be asking themselves those questions about, you know, why do we do this this way? Um, why not do it another way? And that environment is really, really important. And making space for that is also important. And, th and that's what I see as the role of the leaders within organizations to, to be encouraging innovation. Let's double click on that, on that environment piece and the role that leaders have in creating that environment. Talk to us a little bit about what that environment feels like and how we can help create it. And then also maybe like what you have seen come out of it. Because you're kind of famous yes. for this, according to Mary, um, which adds gospel. Mary. Okay. Mary's my publicist. It's very nice. Okay, yeah, <laughs> great, good publicist, good choice. Um, you know, and and as I've always said from from the beginning, I think the first time I was on the Great Women in Compliance uh, podcast, I said I'm a work in progress. I'm still a work in progress on this, and being a leader and creating this environment is work that you have to do every single day. Um, you can't create it and then be like, okay, I've, I've created the environment. It's not something you say, it is an experience that you create for the people on your teams. Um, but I think number one is curiosity, right? The, the, the ask why. I, I have a colleague who, who coined the phrase, ask the second why and the third why. The first why isn't enough. So the first why right. almost always responds with, well, that's the way it's done. That's the way we've always done it, um, but, but why? And so continually having that curiosity and the psychological safety to have people to challenge you, to challenge others, to cross challenge and say, okay, okay, but, but why? And, um, and to empower people who may not be the Mary Shirley's of the world, the people who are brand new in, onto the team, into the space, um, because those people can see things that we all can't see because we have become so ensconced in the conventional wisdom of, of course, every program must do it this way or must have it this way. So that curiosity and psychological safety to be able to continually be asking why is really important. Um, the second is you have to make space for this, right? We all live in a world where I could wake up every day and just answer my emails. I could spend my entire day answering my emails, going on phone calls, going on Teams calls where, where I give uh, uh, Pez dispenser answers. What's the answer to this? Here, here it is. They'll just keep coming back. Um, and so one of the things that we did at, at a a place where Mary and I worked together was no meetings, pick up the call Fridays, pick, no meetings, pick up the phone Fridays, um, because you have to really make space for this kind of deep thought and exploration to be innovative. And there are lots of different ways you can do that, but it has to be with intentionality. Um, you have to really dig in and understand the current state and why. You have to bring in outsiders' perspectives, um, explain the problems to people that you're, you're working through to people who don't know anything about compliance because they'll bring in ideas that will be new. Um, flip assumptions. So ask yourself, you know, I know we've got this limitation, but what if we didn't have this limitation? Um, and, and, and what would we do or could we do if we didn't have this limitation out there? And flipping those assumptions can be a way and creating the space to do that and the, and the willingness for everybody to engage in that. So those are off the top of my head. That's, those 12. Are That's just 12 off the top of your head. See, so you're living up to your uh, the high standards. OK, um, so, Mary, what would you say uh, in response to that or what would you add on to what Lisa just mm -hmm. said? Um, and kind of incorporate Tiffany's question. Thank you, Tiffany. This is a great question uh, on how to encourage your compliance team to keep innovations going. Because, yeah. you know, Lisa kind of talked about this as an ongoing process. You're not going to flip a switch and then, mm -hmm. cool, now we're in innovation mode. It's an ongoing kind of reaction. It's kind of like a bonfire, which takes constant mm -hmm. tending to. And, you know, if that thing is going to continue to grow. So how do we encourage your compliance team to keep mm -hmm. those innovations going? Yeah, I think honestly, a large part of it is that psychological safety that Lisa talked about. So part of it really, it's it's helpful when you've got a leader like Lisa, 
who keeps a real open mind, allows mm-hmm. you to try ideas. And, you know, it's that whole, um, what would you do if you weren't af- afraid of failure? And, you know, obviously failure is an option, but Lisa didn't let that stop her team. And she also put herself on the line. And so an example of this is that um, as a way to, I, I'll bring in um, Compliance Week here, Nick, because it's a theme that that is important to, to Ethico right now. Um, in one of our Compliance Weeks, we started using them as a two-way feedback mechanism. So not just pushing out and doing advocacy and um, outreach and getting a little bit of education out there from compliance, but also getting some data analytics back in for the compliance department to use for gap analysis and improvement. And it's one of the best ways I think that you can truly make use of a training KPI. A lot of us in the space are very critical about the idea of um, using training completion rates as a useful KPI because it doesn't really actually tell you that much. It just tells you that someone sat in a room for 60 minutes in front of you. It doesn't tell you that they learned how to do their job better in light of the guardrails and expectations that the company has. So a better way in which we can understand whether a a person has absorbed our training materials is to take your learning objectives from training or awareness campaigns that you've issued in the last, say, six to eight months in the lead up to your compliance week and use those learning objectives as the answers to quiz questions and things like a Jeopardy game. And then based on the things that people are getting right or wrong, you can see what you st- what you need to go back and retrain on and, and what has really hit home and landed nicely. Um, and we have found a really shocking, um, actually we found multiple shocking instances. So I'd say this is another great opportunity to Um, take what I call there's no uh, lowest common denominator. Take information that you think everybody in your your organization knows about compliance. So that might be something like, um, what is the name of the chief compliance officer? What is the compliance hotline used for? Where can you find the compliance policies? Like basic things we want and expect everybody to know about. But I will tell you that no matter how many times you've told someone what retaliation is, there will be... um, another person who hasn't been listening um, and hasn't been absorbing and paying attention. So when you ask questions like, what is the name of the chief compliance officer and your colleagues give you totally random responses back, or they nominate the wrong person in the compliance function, that's a little gap analysis for you to work on. So the year after we adjusted um, our compliance activities to include uh, what we called a flat Lisa initiative. And so Lisa was our chief compliance officer and not enough people were saying her name and we needed to to address that. And so we in our compliance marketing team that Lisa had formulated um, brainstormed on how we could get people understanding the link between who she was and the the chief compliance officer role. And we came up with the idea, and I'm so sorry for those of you who aren't, um, who weren't raised in the United States like I was, um, this won't immediately hit home, but the idea of it was flat Stanley or flat Lisa, as we called it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sorry if I get this wrong, but my understanding is that flat Stanley is um, like a child's um, book or activity whereby there's a, a Stanley character and you kind of take Stanley everywhere you go. So we kind of turned that concept with Lisa um, into an idea for Compliance Week, and we asked for her permission um, to put herself on the line a little bit, quite frankly, and allow for us to put out like a, a headshot of her and say, print out a copy of Lisa, take a selfie with it, and send it back with a compliance caption. And that was to help people, you know, put a name to the face, the, the concept of compliance. And we got some really awesome entries back. And so, you know, I, I do remember, Lisa, I didn't tell you this at the time, but, you know, there were a couple of people in the marketing team that were like, oh, she's never going to go for this. Like, there's not, you know, there's a chance for our colleagues to abuse it. And Lisa, you know, she thought on it for a moment. And then she was like, nope, let's do this. Like, you know, you think it'll it'll have some benefits. So I, I trust you guys and we will give it a shot. And no one abused it. Um, we got some really cool entries back in and people participated. So um, I, I think you I really do. Line, well. Sorry, Lisa. I drew the line at the cowboy hat, you will remember. Did I try that, to make that year, a cowboy hat? The, Rodeo that rodeo was the theme that year. Yes. And you, you asked me for the cowboy hat and I drew the line there. <laughs> oh, that would have been so clever. Well, I appreciate you drawing boundaries. That's also super important as a leader. Um, and I appreciate me for coming up, with, <laughs> for giving that a try. Um, you know, you, you lose nothing for, 
for, for asking. And so we, we found a great balance, which was just Lisa's um, corporate headshot. And off she went. Um, I don't think anybody drew a cowboy hat on and we didn't ask for it. But, um, you know, that, I think that, again, it's tone from the top is critical. Where you don't have a leader that is so open-minded, I think you've got to go back more to the um, making small improvements, that iterative um, advancement and changes. And um, I would say one thing, you know, um, uh, Kim Yap Chai, who's uh, well known in the space, she worked for quite a sort of a serious organization where there were concerns about, you know, compliance being too silly about initiatives and things. And I think that is a, a big challenge for us is that on the one hand, um, you know, referencing um, Adam's book, we want to come across as being human, relatable and approachable. But on the other, we don't want to be cringeworthy and almost mocked for, for looking lame uh, you know, about the way that we do things. And so there's a fine balance to walk. And so Kim really went out on a limb in her organization that had quite a, a serious mm -hmm. culture and started doing more, um, more fun things like a meme competition. Mm -hmm. And they got huge participation. And so something that she and I have found is that the, the courage to go out on a limb, it, it does take a lot. And you may think in my organiza organization, this will never fly, but you've got to remember in every organization, it is made up with fellow human beings who for the most part have a good sense of humor, um, want their colleagues to be successful, don't always want to be talking about talking shop all day, um, who want to understand different metaphors and analogies that will help us make compliance more relatable. So it can be a big, leap of faith. Um, and yeah, sure, there is room for failure. But I will say, I for those of us who have tried, um, we've all been very pleasantly surprised at, at the results of trying something different that doesn't necessarily align with how the company has always presented compliance and other topics. Yeah. And I mean, innovation is about pushing those boundaries a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Um, you said something I think is really important, which is that we can at least connect on our humanity, right? Everyone goes home after work with a, you know, a pint of ice cream and watches Love, and, Love is Blind in their bed, right? Like we're all doing that, right? Maybe it's just me, mm -hmm. but we all watch the same shows. We all watch the same movies. Uh, to your point, we're humans at the end of the day. And uh, it's not like every single thing is going to work, um, but pushing those boundaries a little bit, I think usually uh, because we're highly conscientious people on average, we have good discernment and good judgment on average. Um, most of those, uh, most of the pushing of the line doesn't really fall flat, at least in what I, what I've seen. Um, yeah. you, you know, a minute, a minute or two ago, you talked a little bit about psychological safety and, uh, Lisa, you were talking about, uh, how important it is to, you know, hear from those people that have those kind of uh, that beginner's mindset or those people who maybe haven't been jaded by, you know, a really stuffy corp corporate program yet. What strategies do you have on really kind of developing that psychological safety for your team and getting some of those fresh ideas, making those new folks feel comfortable saying, hey, why don't we try this a little bit differently? Do you, do you, do you, does does yeah, that question make sense? It does make sense. And I'll, I, I borrowed this innovation from a book called Radical Candor. I adjusted it for my team. Um, so when I went to, from Fresenius to LifePoint to a new chief compliance officer job, um, it, I was going in to completely turn around and transform a team and, um, and there was fear. And so I knew that I wasn't starting from sort of the baseline. I was starting from a place of fear and needing to get to psychological safety. Um, and you can order a bobblehead of yourself. Maybe we've got a trend here. There's flat Lisa and then there's bobblehead Lisa. Um, I ordered a bobblehead of myself in a bumper car. Um, it's called Bumper Lisa. And whoever is willing to engage in constructive conflict with me, challenge me openly in front of a, a meeting, in a private one-on-one -on -one, in any in any way to say like that doesn't sound right. I wanna I wanna disagree with you on that in a healthy, constructive way. Um gets gets bumper Lisa and it gets passed around um, my team and people get to hold on to it until the next person does that. And it took a while That's to awesome. pick up. It sat in my office for a very long time, um, but now Bumper Lisa is, is a much sought after. And there's a little bit of a competition going to be the person who gets Bumper Lisa. And um, 
it has created this environment. Obviously, if I'm giving an award for people who are willing to challenge me, then um, you the the idea that people can can constructively and in a healthy way challenge conventional wisdoms, challenge each other, um, challenge even known things that you know everybody in compliance knows X. Um, that has changed the dynamic, and it was a I think it cost 19.99. It did get it was slow to put into production to put into place because I ordered it in like February of 2020 from China. So COVID kept it, uh, kept it away for a long time, but when it did come, it's quite adorable. (laughs) Well, what a great way to kind of, uh, I mean, what, you know, that's such like a tangible physical manifestation of this concept. That's an idea of meritocracy. I mean, we talk about that a lot in our company and, uh, just talking about that term is not enough, to your point. Having this thing that somebody can win, um, and sh- you know, it obviously shows that you're more than willing to have that idea of meritocracy where the best idea can stand on its own regardless of whether it's coming from you or it's coming from the janitor or from the guy dropping off sandwiches. Like, we want to get the best idea. It doesn't matter who who it comes from. I bet that that has totally transformed uh, your team. That's That's a really cool idea. It's working and I've now taken it to another company and you can see, you can see it's, it's not, doesn't happen overnight. Um, But I thought, and I only got a bumper car because that was the only symbolism that I could find on the website that gave bobbleheads that made sense to me. But in retrospect, I love it because, you know, bumper cars are bouncing off of each other in a fun way. It's fun. It's entertaining. It's, it, it is being willing to like, You know, you think about it when you're a kid, like taking your bumper car and jamming into your mom. Like how often do you get to crash with your mom? And so um, I I think it's turned out to be something that is also fun and has has in it. I think in in Radical Candor, it was just supposed to be a trophy that you passed around. But the Mm -hmm. bumper, the bumper Lisa has become a really good symbolism for that. Oh, it's so smart. Um, the chat is blowing up. Uh, great comments in the chat. Guys, keep those coming. Um, so one of the ideas in Mary's book uh, is about Lisa's idea that Mary took the lead on deploying, which leveraged cross-functional project teams, marketing team and compliance department and so forth. Can you tell us a little bit about how this works, Mary? And Lisa, I want to come back to you because you're kind of this walking hat rack, and I mean that in the most complimentary way possible. Uh, what, imagine that walking hat rack, Lisa, Anyways, we we can brainstorm that after maybe, but like, talk to us a little bit about, you know, how that actually works, Mary. And then I want to hear from you, Lisa, about how you wearing all these different hats allows for sort of the natural, you know, uh, I forget that word you said, recombinant. What was it? Recombinant. Word of the day for me, new word for my lexicon. Uh, Appreciate that. Um, Yeah. I want to talk about how, you know, that, that that breeds a lot of new ideas and sort of cross pollination, but over to you, Mary. Sure. So um, I, I will give a caveat that this idea is one that will work for, for bigger compliance functions. So if you are a team of one right now, I'm, uh, you might want to make a cup of coffee or, or listen for this for when you hit your next big gig and, and move to a bigger team. Um, essentially it was the concept of, and uh, we had a compliance function of somewhere between I think 35 to 40 people in North America when Lisa and I were working together and we pulled together a small group of about six of us team and we Mary we uh we lost you there for a second um you said that you pulled a a group of six of you together Yes, sorry. I um I could see that I'd frozen, and then I heard Lisa say, "Oh no!" So I thought, "Oh, hope I'm not falling off completely." <laughs> um, pulling six of us together from different areas of the compliance function, and so there were people that looked after Canada, um, maybe someone from a data analytics standpoint, someone from the product, someone from healthcare, someone from corporate. And um, these people were the marketing team. And it involved people like myself who were self-identifying as not creative at all. Um, And so for me, it was really uh, challenging in terms of being outside of my um, uh, comfort zone. Um, But it was a really safe space. Uh, and I think, you know, if I can add on to, to what Lisa was saying about bumper Lisa, which is super cool. I wish I had 
and Bumper Lisa worked together, um, is uh, I, I'm from New Zealand, which has a much more direct communication style than the United States. I find here there is a lot of what we call beating around the bush, like dancing around a subject without necessarily directly hitting it head on. And I, I think that's um, nice from a respect standpoint sometimes to avoid conflict, but it's not helpful when, when you just want to like get a, a message out very clearly. And so with the marketing team and with most of the project teams or my Lisa, you know what she was going to say. Go ahead and take it from there. Just take it mid-sentence if you can. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so while Mary gets now. back, <laughs> do not yes. tell Mary how she froze, please, okay? She's going to be horrified. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I, I can pick it up from there um, and just say that, that this cross-functional marketing team. Mary, are you back? Okay. She's back. Go ahead, Mary. Just start over if you can. Just kidding. Go ahead. No. Go ahead, go ahead. I, Mary, I was just saying that it worked, that the, the team came up with ideas that no one, no single member of the team could have come up with on their own. Um, and um, and I was going to go on and talk a little bit about sort of what I would do differently. That, that whole thing was really a, in the beginning, honestly, a strategy to get around corporate marketing. Um, we had a lot of clashes as we were trying to change the look and feel of compliance with the corporate folks. We would they we sent them the information for the new speak up poster and it came back with like practically, I don't think it had handcuffs on it, but you know, like that old sort of don't break the rules, um, speak up if you see it was it it was the typical message. Got and it. And we kept, you know, it, it kept coming back blue and gray and it kept coming back with the approved font. And so it really honestly was a strategy to get around that. Knowing what I know today and having gone more into the recombinant innovation and, and, and what can happen when you actually can do the work to bring two diverse thinking groups together, I probably would do that differently today. I probably would, I'd still have a, um, a marketing focus, but I would work harder to figure out how to get the marketing team to understand what we were doing and why we were doing it, kind of break through some of those, um, so those uh, bubbles and what do you call them, the silos and the, and the territorial fights and, and work harder because I think as successful and fantastic as the marketing team was, that it would have been even better if we had some real subject matter experts on marketing with an open mind that that you that they could learn something too. And um, I think I'm, I am not known for my patience. And so we came up with the workaround instead of doing that hard work. But I now really realize the value of that hard work and probably would do it differently. And how would you do that? How would you I, break was, through that silo honestly, and kind of remold the mind of these marketers that were too, a little bit, it sounds like they were a little bit too rigid. Like the first, the first campaign would be aimed at those marketing folks. Um, really, really spending the time bringing them into the room. Like if this was pre COVID. So people actually got in rooms together, but get, getting into a room together, talking about the vision, not just, it became this, like, who's the real expert? You know, are you an expert on, on how to communicate a message or are you an expert on compliance? And it became sort of a parallel thing as opposed to figuring out how to yeah. cross train on both. And so I would bring in and, and not go to the leader of marketing as in, as probably I did, which was like, your people are driving me crazy. They need to get on board and instead go and really, talk about how we can have a joint success by both of us really leading our teams in, in the same direction. I've learned a lot about leadership uh, and about working within complex organizations since then. And, and so all of that together would have me do it slightly different, but it's not to take away from how, how successful it was. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, that sounds like a, like a good learning um, that you drew from that experience. Now, in your current role where you're, you know, you're doing all these things, legal, compliance, HR, I'm not going to get them all, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. Going back to what you said at the beginning, 
on grabbing ideas from different places. And I'm not going to say the word again, cause I'm going to butcher it, but I do know it now. Uh, how do you, how do you find opportunities to, you know, make those individual messages more resonant uh, across the organization? Yeah. Um, it's probably my favorite thing about wearing many hats is the ability without having to cut through all of that territorial stuff to cross leverage these types of ideas. Um, and, it was February, I think, when HR came under me. And I came into a new company, December 2021. We were formed from two older companies, needed to really reset culture, not just ethical culture and compliance culture, but culture. And so the ability to have HR, legal compliance, risk, um, all together and, and working together and thinking about cross-functional teams because so many issues involve legal compliance, risk, and who did I forget? HR. Um, like we are our people. And so the, the, um, the ability to bring HR into the tent so that we're not creating things and then saying, okay, how do we get HR? So we right. now think of all of it as people strategy. Um, it is all people strategy. How do you get right. people to do what you need them to do, to be engaged, to embrace ideas, to want to do the right thing? Um, and so the whole team is people strategy within the legal boundaries. And um, I don't often have separate meetings. I have a lot of meetings where we bring everybody together um, where we ideate over these things. And it, you know, I don't, there are no boundaries there. You, if someone says to me, well, I can't really speak to this because I'm not in legal, or I can't speak to this because I'm not in HR. Um, I haven't yet figured out a, an anti-bumper Lisa to, to like give out to the people who are doing that, but I'm constantly encouraging people to think across those boundaries um, and we can we can do things that touch all the bases, right? That we are working on something right now that has a consideration across every single one of those things that I think in the old model with different leaders and separate teams in silos would have probably taken us two years to get done. It's gonna take us, it's still gonna take us four or five months because there are a lot of considerations but we're not all coming up with our own position, coming together and trying to meld them. We're coming up with a position that takes into consideration all of those different groups. Well, that's how the challenger exploded. You know what I'm saying? You had all these different groups that just kind of did their parts and put them together. And how much more powerful is the message to the people uh, when that's a united front and everybody's singing in harmony? I love that sort of model of kind of people strategy because the culture of the organization and ultimately the risk profile of the organization is just a function of the sum total of all the behaviors and beliefs of the people in the company. And when you have different people touching, you know, different departments touching, you know, sort of different parts of this, really this sort of one singular message that is meant to guide that, that behavior, you really open yourself to a lot of, um, a lot less potential efficacy, I think. Um, so Lisa, Mary credits you, uh, you know, we had another call and she was just singing your praises. She kind of downplayed a little bit when you were around. So I don't know what that's all about, but she credits you as being, you know, one of the most innovative people in the legal and compliance space. So, you know, you talked a little bit about ideation, getting all these people in a room. What makes you or, you know, how do you better identify which ideas to try out and which ones to discard? And then Mary, I want to come to you to talk a little bit more about innovation mindset after this. But how do we know, like, how do you, how do you know what bets to make? What frameworks do you use to, you know, figure out which of those you're going to launch? It's a really important question because as much as we, as innovation is a work, a work that has to be happening all of the time, it can wear people out. Um, and so I have had to learn over time that you do, you do have to pick and choose. You do have to make bets. I have also learned about myself um, that that impact is my thing. Like when I do my my Hogan, which is my personality profile, um, my coach told me that there are very few people he's seen who are, he's like, they probably don't have to pay you, right? As long as you have impact. So I measure it, I do it based on impact. And there are bets about impact, um, but um, I, I want to do small innovations, but I also really want to look for opportunities to really have impact. But And it's usually impact beyond um, 
the thing, the, the objective we're trying to accomplish. So if there's something that will both um, serve a compliance objective and get people to understand things better and get people to work better together and create new connections. And so that's when I get really excited when there is an idea that will have impact in several different areas. Um, those are the things that are, are really worth investing in, taking bigger risks and trying, because a lot of times it may not serve one of the objectives. Um, I, an example I have is um, we created at Fresenius these risk reference cards, which is an, an idea I got from, from a conference, I think a Gartner conference. And it was to try to boil down the compliance risks of the whole organization into five risk reference cards. That was really hard. <laughs> and we brought the whole wow. team together. I don't actually know whatever happened to the actual risk reference cards, but the process of getting all the, the team together to level set around what the risks were and what that really meant and how to get it at the right level. Like it, should it be this very high referral source or should it be this very low, the 27 different things you can do wrong, or is it in the middle? That process um, was worth doing, even though the risk reference cards themselves, I don't know what happened to them. They may have been used, they may not have, but things that serve many different purposes, um, you're likely to have a positive impact from something. And so those are some of the ways I, I look at it, but I do have to be very conscious of the fact that my ideation, um, which happens to me when I'm in the shower, in the pool, in, in out on a walk, can wear people out, uh, people who have day jobs. And so it is really important to, to have some kind of process for thinking through it. Some of it's gut, to be honest. Um. So for those of you who aren't, who don't have Lisa's gut, um, there's a method that we use. There's a framework we use when we're trying to figure out which kind of moves to make. And it's really a kind of a solution selection framework and it leverages uh, the wisdom of crowds essentially. So if you have a team of people in a room, five or 10 of you, whatever, and you you have the, these lists of ideas, you can just set up a little table in, in, in Excel or like Google Sheets and then have, you know, rows for all the ideas and then across the columns look at things like you know rate on a scale of one to five no threes of you know feasibility impact or effectiveness uh cost and speed and if you can aggregate those things you usually can uh you know the best ideas usually kind of rise to the top you know obviously adding those scores the ones with the highest impact and you know cost is obviously a negative one um are going to be the ones that you might be able to make those bets on you know quicker so uh it's not su super scientific but it allows for the kind of the uh quantitative aggregation of everybody's individual gut level thinking to you know at least pr put some numbers around to help guide you know, what decisions you, you, uh, you might want to pursue. But I mean, so much of our game is like this thinking of, of bets framework. You know, we can't go all in on everything where we talked at the beginning of the conversation about this sort of incrementalism and this continuous improvement in order to do that effectively, you have to make a bunch of small bets and then double down on the ones that are, that are actually working. Um, Lisa or, uh, Mary, when we're talking about, you know, innovation and, um, you know, how we kind of turn that on, talk to us a little bit about kind of how we can get better into an innovation mindset. Oh, we're, uh, we don't have sound from you, Mary. I'm sorry. Um, so we can't hear you when, how do you think about innovation mindset? Um, Lisa, I think um, I think I've hit on this with the making time, making the space for it, um, and uh, I talk. I am constantly um, looking outside of my space for ideas. Um, I'm a big fan of podcasts. I spend a lot of time, but I. Other than Mary's, I rarely listen to compliance podcasts because or legal podcasts or anything like that. I, I love HBR Idea Cast, which is a Harvard Business Review. Um, and speaking of wearing people out, like people will know when I'm on my HBR Idea Cast thing because I'll, things pop in my head. Um, so really like getting out of this space, making the time, clearing the mind, trying to learn something new 
um, that may be completely foreign to the, the problems you're trying to solve. Um, nine times out of 10, when I have a problem on my mind and I put on those headphones and I listen to somebody telling how they solve some other kind of problem, there will be something in there that clicks with me and then my brain just starts racing. Um, so I think it is both being intentional, but also opening your mind because innovation is not something you can force and an innovative mindset is not something you can, there's not a step step guide to it. It is, it is really freeing your mind to allow itself to, to just start processing a lot of things. Yeah, I would say, uh, I think I, I agree kind of wholeheartedly with you. Um, you can't force the innovation, but you can set yourself up for uh, more innovation inspiration. And um, I think I just want to kind of remind everybody that innovations are kind of local, right? They're localized, right? Levi's jeans existed for decades here, but that was a massive innovation when they started being sold in Japan. There are uh, there's a ton of uh, you know, public information available for other organizations that, for example, have a really great compliance week program, or maybe they have a great sort of speak up campaign or a great way to address anti-retaliation. You can creatively borrow from those other things you see out there or creatively borrow ideas from, you know, Mary's book and start implementing those. And those are going to be innovations in your organization. I also want to, um, I studied art history in college and, uh, during the Renaissance, that was a time of like massive, um, you know, art innovation, right? There was a ton of, you know, mannerism and, a, you know, uh, there was a massive like shift forward in, um, you know, what art was doing. And there's all of these, uh, you know, phenomenal, you know, wildly famous um, artists from that time. And one of them, who's probably my favorite is the artist Raphael. And he did no innovations on his own, but instead he combined these, these innovations that other artists were doing you know, on mannerism and on perspective and all those things. And he just, he just recombined those things. And there's a modern day Raphael in uh, Quentin Tarantino who grabs things from all these other different movies. And he just kind of remixes them into his movies to tell his story. And so you can creatively borrow from all of these sources around you, whether it's a podcast, you know, the uh, HBR uh, ideas podcast, or it's things from a book, or it's something you see in another uh department doing or another organization doing, feel free to creatively borrow those things and put your own artistic quote unquote spin on it uh, to drive an innovation that doesn't exist in your, you know, locality. Mary, how are we doing? Are you, are, are we back here? Let's do a little mic check. No, we oh, can't no. hear her. If Lisa and Mary do ESL, we maybe she can do the hand signals and then you can translate for her. But Nick, one of the things that Mary and I talked about ahead of time was talking a little bit about, especially in, in the healthcare space, in the compliance space, what are the challenges? Like, are there structural things that make it more difficult? Um, and I think there are. Can we can we discuss that? Because I think it's important. Yeah, please. Point. Please do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and um, this is going to be um, a little bit outside of the norm of what you're going to hear, a little bit maybe heretic. Um I think that the fact that Ooh. we have these very we have these very well defined expectations from the government of what an effective compliance program is actually becomes a real barrier to true effectiveness. Um, because you know, I think people say like, "I am afraid to do this thing that is different from what everybody else do, does." That checks the government box that says this is one of the elements of an effective compliance program. And this difference between what the government, how the government defines, like how you meet that standard that the government has set forth of what's effective and how you actually are effective. I think it's about people strategies. Compliance is about people strategies. And there's really nothing in the seven elements of an effective compliance program or eight or whatever you want to call it that talks about how do you really engage people? What are you doing? You know, it says that compliance training should be effective and you should measure whether people are taking it in. But, but I think that the, the, the conventional wisdom that has built up around how you check those boxes actually ends up being a chilling effect on people willing to try new Agreed. and different things that might actually work. Um, and so you're going to have to constantly do this balance and be ready to answer that question of, what like what will you what will you say to the government? And I'm I'm going through this right now. We're we are 
throwing out the old way of doing policies and doing something very different. And I keep getting the question from people who are like, what if the government asks us for a policy and we don't have it? And I say, I'm very confident that if I can show that we are our strategy and our, the innovations that we're doing are all toward having people actually act in a way that is compliant and I don't have the piece of paper that I'm going to be able to convince the government that my, that we've met the effectiveness standard, but it's, it's, a, it's a slog. It's much easier to just do what the government says is effective than to actually think through and take some risks and try to be effective. So I think that's kind of interesting what you're saying. I mean, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think it is in the title, though. It's about being effective. And I think we're playing, to your point, I mean, this is people's strategy. We have to overcome this, like, wall of inattention. And we have to overcome this bad brand, you know, that clamps people up, not just on the innovation within the compliance program side, but clamps people up on the employee side, uh, where these walls come up and they don't want to get in trouble and they, you know, they want to avoid the cops and the speed trap and all that kind of stuff. At the end of the day, if we're trying to affect behavior and for us to be effective, uh, those behaviors need to change. Well, then we have to overcome that attention. We have to gain more attention and we can get proxies for participation, whether it's through hotline calls or more reports to managers or culture surveys or things like that. But I think on the one hand, it's a little limiting, right? Because there's not that sort of clear guidance. There's not a bunch of boxes from the DOJ guidance that like we can check. But on the other hand, it can be kind of freeing because I think from my experience, most of the time folks are looking for, you know, progress forward. Is the program effective? Is it actually doing what, it, what, what it's supposed to do? And there is room, you know, again, it's going to be pushing an envelope a little bit. It might be kind of, uh, you know, moving away from the conventional wisdom, but there is room for that innovation, like uh, Mary was saying, to humanize the program more, because how else are you going to crowdsource risk intelligence? How, al how else are you going to get more risk intelligence from the people in the organization if they're not activated? You know what I'm saying? Like they have to be activated. They have to be turned on. They have to be, uh, you know, participants in a culture where they feel that belonging, they feel that psychological safety, and they feel that ownership for this thing that we're all trying to build, you know? It, as a leader, though, you I agree with everything you said. And as a leader, um, you have to be prepared, though, for that feeling of discomfort that people have totally. when you're not spending all of your time doing the thing that the government says you must do. Um, it, it's, it is challenging. And, it, but, and to find that balance, we have to pay attention to that. We have to. That's, it is a very, very important thing. But ultimately, the government is not my consumer in this the employees Great are. Great point. And with that comment, we broke 1,500 emojis. Brand new record. Phenomenal, Lisa. Uh, how are we doing, Mary? You want to do a little mic check? Am I Am I here? She's back. Give us some more. Oh. Give us some more emojis oh, for uh, for Mary. <laughs> I'm so sorry, everyone. Nick, I'd, I'd love to answer one of your questions real quick in one minute, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah. That I wasn't able to before. Um, so... Um, you know, you were asking about mindset, and I think one of the things that, you know, we need to think about when it comes to being a bit much in compliance is remember that there are things that you can do that are not going to touch on the business. You should be reviewing things more holistically, like, when, for example, when was the last time you reviewed your KPIs? Take a look at those. Have you reviewed those in light of data analytics coming into force, um, artificial intelligence? When was the last time you took a, a good look at your job descriptions? Have you looked at those to really assess for what are true requirements that we need versus what are just nice to haves? Because from a diversity, equity and inclusion standpoint, we know that women apply for jobs only when they meet 60% of the requirements. So let's be really thoughtful about only putting in requirements that need to be there. Don't just keep your job descriptions how right. you've always done them. For example, uh, driver's license may not need that these days. Um, and that'll help with your DEI efforts as well as your continuous improvement. So smart. So good. Um, do we have time for one more question that we can squeeze in? Uh, I say let's do it. We are on a roll today. So Tiffany asked uh, this question. Thank you for this question, Tiffany. And I'd love to hear it, hear it from uh, both Lisa and Mary. Um, what are three quick tips you would give someone who's just starting out in compliance? So you guys are at the top of the compliance mountain, okay? Yeah. Uh, this is someone just kind of getting into the foothills. What are the mindsets that folks can start to bring in to be a really impactful uh, ethics and compliance officer, regardless of you know their organization size? Should I go? 
um, sign up ahead, to Mary. as many yeah, newsletters, thought leaders as you can. I wrote an article that's freely available on um, recommended mm -hmm. Uh, newsletters to sign up to publications and uh, thought leaders to follow in the space. It's just a starting point, uh, but that would be my first tip. Lisa, do you have number two? I do. Um, I would say recognize that there are two different tracks that you need to be focused on. One is subject matter expertise. So whatever industry you're in, you should start to understand the regulatory risks, the legal risks. You, you need to work to, to build the competency on that, but that's not it. As I've been talking about sort of endlessly, this is a people business, people strategy. You understand that intuitively and you bring to the table something that I don't because I'm not of your generation. And so um, there are other people in your organization who are of your generation. You have something already to offer on that, whether you are, are brand new or not. So that's my second tip. Feel empowered. Great. And then who's, who's, who say, wants to do, do number three? Read Mary's book. Yeah, I was actually, <laughs> that's what I was going to say. Read Mary's book. Uh, you can literally turn to any page in this thing. I love this thing. I've sounded so much smarter. Uh, if you guys think I've sounded a little bit smarter, here's my hack right here. Here's my uh, my tip. So thank you all for staying. Thank you, Lisa. This was an absolute joy. Mary, uh, so great to get you on the ethics verse. Uh, round of applause for these guys. Hope you guys can join us next week. Uh, connect with Lisa. Connect with Mary. Uh, follow Mary on LinkedIn, obviously. Uh, she has a great... Um, uh, you write articles every week or month or something for um, uh, CCI. So yeah. check that out. Um, and yeah, pick up the books. Uh, join us next week where we're going to be talking about uh, proxy forms and how to activate middle managers. And I will see you on the next uh, Ethics Verse Day. See you guys next week. Mm -hmm.